Recording is on. Well, hello again, everybody. It's December the 5th, and this is the Western meeting. We had the Eastern meeting this morning. Uh, so welcome to the Extinction Party, and I'll throw the floor open to anybody that wants to voice anything, uh, any topics that they want to discuss, any questions they got. How is everybody? I'm doing pretty good. And how are you guys? All good here. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going back to work after a three week vacation. So um, it's going to be a shock tomorrow. Did you I have, have to get jabbed to go to work? Pardon me? Did you have to get jab? Is it mandatory? Um, we can opt to get tested every week. So I have not been jabbed. Um, at this point in time, I just feel work is getting um, more difficult as far as, um, yeah, all the requirements, the changing, I consider it a changing condition of employment. And I believe it will um, creep even more into just being mandated totally. So I'm making plans to exit. Problem is that so many contracts in the US are employment at will. So they can just, you know, come in one morning and say, just firing you because of the weather. So yeah, it's completely in the employer's hands, although the, the law claims that it's an equitable contract. But how can it be an equitable contract? It's like nobody can survive without a job. Nobody can get get medical care without a job, really, before Obamacare. So it's like it's ridiculous. But with, yeah, with the, I've, yeah, sorry, I've I've come to the point where I used to think, oh, I have uh, good health benefits, have a good insurance plan, have good pension. But um, I've come to the point that at any time those can be taken away, especially right now. Um, I hear there are uh, rumblings afoot of um, insurance premiums becoming higher for people who are not vaccinated, um, all kinds of things. So at any time, the spigots could be turned off, even though one can say, well, I earned those. That's my pension money. That's my health insurance. Um, at any time, it can, the carpet can be pulled from under one. And it's a false sense of security to say that, you know, like for someone like me who's striven for security um, in all my work decisions, um, at any time, it can, they can be taken away. They're just illusions. But, um, uh, you know, intellectually, I've come to that. But emotionally, I haven't, or psychologically, I haven't accepted the the reality of that, that, you know, like, you, you can't say, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I, I put aside these things. I, um, I plan for my future. Um, there is no future. And at any time, whatever you saved could be 
taken from you. Yeah, it's, it's shocking how the American workplace and the American corporation pretends to be people's parents and they reinforce it with language like, you know, the, the family, they, so many companies say, you know, the such and such family. And it's all a big con because you're not family. They, you know, it's uh, so many people I know of, of, have been fired just because, you know, drinks outside of work. They've been bad mouthing the management or something. And the, you know, one guy uh, a couple of years ago, he, he was um, having a, a, a drink. He didn't realize that the CEO was standing behind him and he was bad mouthing the CEO. And he was just fired on the spot. Uh, and this is, you know, in a, in a bar after work, outside of work. So um, I, I, I've been fired from American Corporation for calling the, the Mormons a cult. The, the, there were a lot of Mormon guys and the CEO was a Mormon. And, and they, they spent all their time trying to, you know, indoctrinate me with Mormonism and get me to join the LDS. And uh, I said to this one guy, you know, this... It's a it's a cult, and he said, "What?" <laughs> I said, "It's a cult. Uh, it's provable. It's a cult." And so uh, he said, "Okay, that's it." And he went straight to HR. Was fired <laughs> for calling the LDS a cult. Uh, no, I, I have a question for the American people here because um, I don't know. I, I'm really don't understand much about law and legality, but I know that. The states are, uh, it's just like a network, a web of, of legalities and solicitors and, and lawyers and everything. Now, when you, when you have to, when you work as a doctor, it's compulsory from the medical council to have a, an insurance. You can't work as a doctor without being insured in case you mess up. And of course, they make a lot of money on your, your back after that. But um, the vaccine or the, the jab, that's okay. I'm not going to say anything against it there. Um, but um, you're not, uh, they're not, the pharmaceutical are not liable. Uh, you can, you can't sue if something happens, which is one of the only therapeutics that I know, because all sorts of other drugs or other health uh, situations like surgery, and it's the only procedure that I'm really sure of that you cannot um you cannot sue the companies for. So I wonder, is there anybody in in America in the in the legal world uh, looked at that? Is it impossible? Yeah, they, they, no, they were given special indemnity because of the circumstance. So the they went to the government and they said, on condition of having this early experimental release, they wanted indemnity and they were given it. So. The, the government has indemnity. They give themselves indemnity rights. So if you're in the military, you haven't got a hope of suing the government. Um, if, if you're in a policeman, teacher, or something, even even in the states, um, you really haven't got a hope. The, 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 the military can do what they effectively like, and there'll be no recourse. Even you can have a military tribunal is all you can hope for. But a lot of people in the military have been hard done by and they, you know, especially in the Gulf War and Gulf War syndrome, and there's absolutely no recourse. You, you um, they make when you join, join up, they make you sign away all your rights, and, and companies do as well. Um, so it's it's all based on contract law, and the the big fiction is that it's between two consenting parties of equals. So it's. There's a, there's a standard in law called of commercial law called the meeting of minds. And they say that, you know, if the two, a, a contract can be invalidated if there wasn't a meeting of minds, if there was a genuine misunderstanding, um, or there was an asymmetric relationship, or the contract was signed under duress. Now, the, the, the up and down, every state's jurisdiction that I know of, the federal and Supreme Courts, every circuit court has upheld the thing that, that a bit contract between an organization like a corporation and an individual is um, a, an, a free contract done between equals. And they will not accept the argument that you have to have a job and the, the employer doesn't have to have employees. So that, you know, you could, the, it's very flexible about whether you take on employees. So the, the bargaining chip is entirely in the employees hands to the point where 
you know, the, the, what, what does the company lose if it doesn't employ you? Nothing. But, but you might starve to death in America. And so, but the courts won't uphold that it's, it's um, a contract signed under duress, but clearly it is. So there's, there's no protection. All the unions have been gutted. They were gutted since Reagan uh, fired all the air traffic controllers. And they just went through with the scythe um, during the 80s. There's nothing left now. The truckers union, all of them were gone, steel union. And they punished. Part of what globalism was to do was to punish the, the workers for being too up to The guys in Flint, Michigan and stuff, they were they were all laid off. And it, and, and uh, the auto, auto works were sent abroad. It was done to stick it to the unions. It was to spite them. And so, you know, labor can't move, but the the manufacturing could move. So they gave companies carte blanche to offshore, but strict, strict uh, rules on movement of labor and, um, you know, foreign employment. And that's that's how they did it. Um, so global, uh, one of the primary things of globalism, which was almost stated in the WTO, was to, to break the back of labor. That was one of its goals and it was tremendously successful. All, all of this is, uh, you know, uh, Hayek and Milton Friedman and their economics that the neocons put into practice and was cheered by people like Joseph Stieglitz. But Stieglitz has re kind of recanted. He's kind of admitted that globalism was bad and it was bad for the workers. But, but yeah, that's the reality. Thank you. Uh, but does anybody know in Europe, is it the same, have... Uh... Have the pharmaceutical companies who are producing the jabs made similar deals with um, the governments of UK, France? I don't know because I, I'm nobody knows that. Or... I think they made an agreement with the EU. I'm not sure what the status is in the UK, but I guess they followed suit. But the EU, as far as I know, gave them indemnity as well. Because because it's experimental. They knew it was experimental and they knew that if anything went drastically wrong, they'd be subject to recourse. So so nobody has any recourse now because uh, the, you can't sue the government and, and the government says you can't sue the, the pharmaceuticals. So that's one of the reasons why it's immoral to, if not illegal, um, unconstitutional to force people to have this medical procedure because it is experimental and there's no recourse. So they, they're forcing you to do something where there's, um, you, you have no ability to fight back in a tort case or a case of injury. I was reading something and uh, I, I can't remember the exact citation, but there's something about CF43. I can look it up later and um, send it to the group, but it said that, um, it is illegal, and I don't know if it's unconstitutional, to force people to, to be part of clinical trials. And so mandating the jab is basically forcing people to participate in clinical trials without their knowledge, that there's no informed consent. So um, yeah, somebody was referring to that part of I think the Constitution. I'll, I'll have to look it up and, and send it to you guys. Was, and they also mentioned something about, I don't know if it's related to the Nuremberg Code, but uh, we can't force people to be in experimental clinical trials without their knowing it. And basically because the, especially, well, the, 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 the jabs are experimental, basically people are... Uh, the subject of the clinical trials, which are not even completed yet, they're ongoing. Yeah, there, there, there are precedents for mandating jabs. Um, the um, you will you won't ever get the government on this one because the, the government reserves the, the right to do to do these kind of things. You know, like you know, Kazi comitatus and stuff like posse comitatus and, th and stuff like that they in in st in a state of emergency they they will do this so um 
they didn't really just declare states of emergency. So it's very gray, but the courts always uphold the government because when it comes down to it, they are, they're an arm of the government. <laughs> so there, there's no legal course, a recourse that you can actually take on it, on any of the stuff. It'll be struck down wherever you go. Um, but the, it's it's in the Geneva Convention, but there isn't a court where you can you can bring a suit like this and um, uh, get retribution. So that's that's the big the big problem. Even if you won against the government, the government would tell you to sort of <laughs> they, they wouldn't they wouldn't um, pay you. And if you went and go and see some of the government property, they would they would uh, arrest you. But you know, maybe we should talk talk about the subject about the totalitarianism because I think people are getting worried, and I think people are getting worried in in Australia. Um, but it's it's not as bad as you imagine. <laughs> I don't think it's actually a good thing. So what it's doing is it's radicalizing people, and we need more radical people. So overall, it's it's very good. Now the thing is, what to do about it in the short term? I I would have this advice: is like uh, kind of what I've said before, but I'll say it again. The the don't be too um, don't be too hard over, right? So don't be too rigid. Be ready to bend. Uh, you may have to bend and get the job. What I what I recommend is if you are in in the refuse next camp um, and you want to be a refuse next is is don't be too absolutist about it. Don't 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 let them break you. The the whole point is is to to is to see who breaks first. And this is the government or the people. And so you must always be ready to just fold and and just take a jab. Um, the thing is to make them pay for it so it's a pirate victory. So so uh, you you want it to to stretch it out, make it more and more difficult. You see the, as I said before, the, the government is, appears monolithic. They seem very, you know, this this big, indomitable bully um, that you you just an irresistible force that you can't defeat. And it's like it's not like that at all. <laughs> it's the the governments can are going right out on a ledge for this. All the politicians' careers are hanging on a thread for this. Um, the, you know, in Greece and stuff the. Uh, Cyprus, not Cyprus, so the, I can't remember what the guy's name is, but he, he agonized about this decision. The reason why he agonized about it is because if you mandate stuff for over 60 year olds, you know, there's a long, long experience where the farmers in Crete, they don't take any shit. They got on ferries and went to Syntagma Square uh, more than once and brought down the fucking government. So you don't mess with a Cretan farmer. They say we're Cretan first and Greek second. And, then they, and they, they treat everything like the invasion of Crete by the Nazis. So, so they tend to go to Syntagma Square with rifles if you're not careful. And, and so, they, so the government doesn't do these things lightly. The, the government is terrified. They're quaking in their boots when they do all this stuff. So they put on a brave face and they they sound bombastic and you've got to realize they weak and they cowering and they're shivering in their boots when they do this stuff. So they always they're psychopaths, they're pushing the limit. They always go pushing to see what they can get away with. So so my recommendation is the kind of thing you gotta think of is make them pay, go take it down to the wire. So if they do all of these things, uh, you want to make sure that um, they take a bigger hit than you do, but don't don't stand on principle and go down in flames. That's not a good plan. But when, for example, this is what I would recommend to to, to maybe Greeks and stuff. If if they mandate something like over sixties get a hundred euro fine a month, you know, but if they if they don't get job, it's like. Uh, what you do is, is pay, you know, if you can, and you don't want to, um, pay the hundred. Just stay, you see what they're doing with a lot of these things. They say, you know, in Austria and Germany, and they're saying like, you must by February. 
it's it's terror tactics. They're trying to use terror against the people. What they want you to do is say, okay, I can see we're not going to win this and cave. And you say, don't do that. Take them down to the wire. It's it's a test of strength. That's and so you have to show your will all the way down to the wire. And then you want to you want to take it as far as it goes. Pay the fines. Make them pay. See, by the time you're paying a hundred a month, the situation would have changed. There might be a big reversal in the public's viewpoint. There might be people rioting in Syntagma Square. They might not. You see, they say they're going to collect that fine automatically. In other words, they're going to dock. 60 year olds pensions right and put it towards the healthcare system that's it's a lie it'll just go to germany and everybody knows that for payments on the interest on the loan but anyway the the thing is to to call, call their bluff is say is say how much can i actually afford the thing is not to say okay i fold i understand these guys are just totalitarian and they're gonna they're stronger than me and fold that's what they're trying to get you to do what, what you want to do is to say, how much can I afford? How much would I make uh, do this principle? A couple of hundred, 300, a thousand? Then pay it. Pay it for 10 months for the fine and just see how this goes down. <laughs> you see, that they, they might have to repeat it. You see, they, they're taking a big hit that'll last. You see, they, this stuff is not forgotten. And so it's actually a good thing. It's, it's, pre it's preparing people for the time when they know it's showing people how governments react in a crisis and every bit that you re you resist now cows the government and make sure that they're not such a bully in the next crisis. So this is all good stuff. Um, so yeah, the, the good news is that the G variant is um, it's very, very infectious. It's tearing around South Africa, but the, uh, yeah, so in the next six to seven weeks, it's going to go nuts all over the world. Um, the thing is, it's not very infectious. I mean, not no, it's super infectious. The symptoms are mild. So there's only one thing left to worry about for this thing. It's it's not it's not going to. I mean, the 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 the, the V words, are, you know, the jabs are not going to really help you with it. <clears throat> but it, the thing is, I don't think you need them. It, it's there's only one thing to worry about, and that's the thing about is it a chimera with HIV? So does it, it compromise your immunity? That may be the reason why it can get around so fast. Uh, there's no herd immunity to it. Reinfection is the is the norm. So the but uh, this it could drive out all the other variants um, and and become dominant if it isn't something that has a retroviral aspect that it can compromise your immune system like HIV, um, then it might be a good thing. That <laughs> the thing might have turned into the cold and um, then then it'll be, it'll all of the stuff will be over, right? So um, I would say, you know, delay, um, try and, try and uh, make, make it costly for, for them to do it and try and radicalize people. And show resistance. The key thing is to show resistance to the government, not the bug. <laughs> and so, the yeah, the thing is that that um, it's not the end of the world. They the they will do these things, and they will try and keep them in place. They'll try and keep passports in place and things like that because it'll they want it to be a social credit score. But they are arousing enmity, and if the it's better that they institute all these things and then we have a backlash before the real collapse, right? This is not collapse, right? This is this is just an inconvenience on the road, and this this will sh this shows their colours and it it really aids us. So it it really aids the people and Team Human because it's it's shown a, a whole raft of complacent people in the middle that the government is not to be trusted and they're your worst friend in a crisis. So governments should topple. There are going to be backlashes left and right in, de in democracies. This is all good. Right? It's, it's all very good news. Don't, don't be cowed by it. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah. So that's what i got to say. What, do you have anything to add to that, Sophie? No, thank you very much. Um, you were going to talk about um, 
authoritarianism and um i was going to you know this morning we 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 touched a little bit on that um with the eastern meeting uh but i think maybe we need to you see you you, you mentioned yes this is a test run we, we're going to we might it's not the it's not the collapse they're establishing uh certain patterns of surveillance social credits different passports different apps and all sorts of other maybe we don't know <laughs> most of all we don't know and i would like maybe we could start to talk about this a little bit more um uh, the looming uh, totalitarian uh, plan you can't really stop it so no. the thing is to to realize that all these moves are bluff so they they might sound really assertive and scary just remember they all bluff this 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 is a paper tiger and it only lasts as long as people haven't seen through the bluff so they they will crack heads they'll put on big shows of force but they all done um as terror tactics governments are terrorists and they basically cow ever since the dawn of time they've cowed the people so you know when when the rabble get rowdy is like napoleon uh when he was a corporal he was a gunner and he, his first real act of um in the military was to use grape shot against the crowds again during the french revolution so it's it's grape shot is a terror tactic to get the people off the streets and so but you, you have to read it from the other side. Everybody reads the rebel side and all the bad stuff that happens to the rebels. Read the other side. The guys are quaking in their fucking boots. They, 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 you know, they use terror and thank their lucky stars when the rebels stand down. And the rebels say, oh, you know, this is, who can stand up against this might? It's almost anybody. You were almost there, but you you came in because you didn't realize that the guys were actually bluffing. You see that? See the cannons probably have like a couple of shots of grape shot. They wouldn't load them if 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 the guys didn't go down in the first wave. They'd be on them. You could tear those soldiers from limb from limb. But they they trust that they will get you in the first go. And and ninety nine percent of the time they're right because everybody is a sheep. But if they just knew what it was like on the other side, they would push their advantage and they would win every time. <laughs> the advantage is always with the ants, right? If the locusts are always bluffing. What they said in the Hollywood movies, like the ants, the ants movie, <laughs> the bug's life, is that that is exactly how it is. As soon as the, the ants see through the locust game, the game is over. It's, so it's, so it's, it is a game of psychology. And it's, it's all a game of can they make you stand down before you realize your own power. So, that, so that's the thing. And the other thing is you can't stop this going towards the totalitarian right. The, the left has just played such a bad game and it's, it's just its own worst enemy. So it is gonna, you know, it's going to be a right-wing swing. The, the, yeah. Take heed, everybody on the left, you know, LGBTQ people and stuff, take heed, is all the stuff you've achieved will be rolled back in a minute because there's a backlash. Every action has an equal reaction. It's a it's, it's Newtonian thing. Um, it's Newton, Newton's first law, right? So it's like, yeah, there will be a, a, a big backlash. So, so think of, you know, get used to living under a totalitarian regime. There's not much different between the left and the right in terms of totalitarian regimes. They all look the same. They're all modeling on China. So China you know, is leading, leading the way, and you can see how they are. But the, the major thing is that the people like their chains. They love their chains. And so the people will welcome it. They, they always do all this stuff. You know, I mentioned about chipping you. And so people will, will welcome their chips because they'll be sold as convenience. They'll say, you... You know, oh, you don't like the pesky thing on your phone, and you know, it's such a nuisance. Well, we've got a new improved version. You can just get a chip and just walk into places, and they'll show you, <laughs> and everybody will love it. Oh, this is much easier. <laughs> and that's how they'll get it. Like a few years before, you would have said, hey, come come a few years down the road, you're going to be chipped. 
And they'd be like, oh, you conspiracy theorist, you tinfoil hat nutcase, they'd never do that. Nobody would stand for that. Yeah, they will, because they do it slowly. <laughs> they boil the frog slowly. And, and everybody loves it because they 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 get habituated and they get they they adapt and they forget about the past so all the past things the echoes of people that say no no you're selling out the freedoms we died for those become a distant echo people people forget their freedoms and people become relying as stockholm syndrome they rely on the people that are terrorizing them and as soon as the, you know bolsonaro all these guys they know the, the, the worse you make the situation, the more they cling to the state. So, so prepare for this this world, because that's that's where we we headed for. So, how do you resist? Is for starters, you do things like we're doing now. You do things like organizations like like underground that that resist. So, so a small tight knit group is the worst nightmare. For, for the state because they it's hard to penetrate and, and they resist it's if people that think differently will tend to have their thinking reinforced as the government does so so you will see it now the more militant they get militancy is a sign of desperation and the more militant they get the harder the the opposition will get so so they they instead of you know making everybody comply they're hardening the opposition. So it's, it's all good. They're hardening and radicalizing people and, and driving them underground. All of these things are good. What you need for, to survive totalitarianism is large underground networks, and, uh, informal networks, little you know networks of how you get things done. It's how everybody survived in the Soviet Union. They had little uh, black markets and you know little people that people that you could go to that could sort shit out and so you get little underground SARS that are right in the middle of the apparatus and they can give you the permit they can you know they so solidarity with you those are the people that do the most damage to the state and and do the the most for the people you, you know you don't want the state to be be there when the collapse happens go uh, we've talked about threads the thing go and have a look at that those guys in threads were exactly what they'll do you see i mean people in britain are really complacent because they've had it good for a long time but what was good about threads was it showed people that you know you're living a dream and go and have a look at the disaster i tried to get extinction rebellion to do this but they're too pro the system they're all liberals right they all they all they're not really anti the system, so they they wouldn't do it. But the best thing to do is to go uh, and Rupert Reid actually agreed. Is you go and look at the disaster plans. You go and demand the disaster plans in your county. And if you go and look at the disaster plans, the emergency management plans in your county, first of all, they're probably secret. But the you can get the the ones from. If, if they won't give them to you, freedom of information or anything like that, you you can go and uh, look at the Cold War ones because those ones are available. And they, they haven't changed much since the Cold War. And see those things, they're grisly. One of the things in the UK that people don't realize is that you, the House of Lords, by the way, takes over in a disaster. If, if the central government fails, they send out the Lord to your basically you know just your um uh what's the name of cornwall or duchy of cornwall or whatever you will get this lord who is probably a nutcase and he will have absolute authority i mean absolute i mean he can he can summarily judge people and have them shot on the spot he's judge jury and executioner literally that's the power he will have when and so he he will get in his his land yacht or Range Rover, and he will come to the county, and he he can declare prima nocta rights on women. He can he can do what he fucking likes under those circumstances. I mean, I'm surprised the guys haven't engineered it just for fun. But I don't think people know that. They don't know what what happens. I think they all think it it's all rather nice, and people in you know high globe jackets come around to help you and you get nurses and doctors and the army everybody wants the army 
oh, the army must come in and drive the trucks and give the fuel and run the power stations. It's like, no, the army's there to fuck you up. That's all they're there for. They're security detail to protect property rights. Nothing else. They don't, they, the army does not do, do uh, medical aid for civilians and shit like that. <laughs> they're not going to waste their supplies on, on civilians, right? Go, go and have a look at the history. So the best thing that an organization like, like XR could do is to do some of those terror tactics. And the best terror tactics is to tell people what the state has in store for you when, when the shit hits the fan. But that will wake people up because they think the government's on their side. But there's nothing shows you that the government is the worst enemy than seeing the emergency management plans because they're drawn up in civilian times in peace and they re reveal the darker side of these psychopaths, right? The powers they give themselves and the, the scenarios they run in their heads are just extraordinary. And they, the funny thing about it is they're co so consistent all over the world. <laughs> they, they're dark, they're very, very bleak, and they they so similar around the world. It's, it, you know, I think the best thing an anarchist can do is just let people know what what the government has planned for an emergency and that cures you it's basically you're not a liberal you don't see, after you've seen one of those plans there's no way you're a liberal you're like you'll be a jittering wreck thinking come on seriously this is what these guys are planning and say yeah and here's the shitty thing it's coming there's no ways it's not coming right if you have a look at the situation we're in and the collapse overshoot the number of people that are being born every day it's like there's there's no scenario I can see where this winds up as roses and permaculture and loving sharing shit. It's just fantasy. So so psychologically I, preparing being tough uh, psychologically is is a, I I put a, th a link to the movie thread on the comments, and I also put a link to the one of the Rockefeller guide for strategic disaster, but. Um, if you have any other, I think you had one, Hugh, that you posted a long time ago on Reddit, not a long time ago, actually, that was very interesting, and I, I've lost it. It was also, um, I think it was also a Rockefeller thing on on uh, disaster plans. So if, if ever you, you have these things again, maybe you could send them to us or post them to us, because I think they are interesting to, to spread. A lot of people don't know about these things, and it can be a, a really eye-opening for liberals to to look uh, in the eyes of the beast. Yeah, that one I was was the Rockefeller Institute, and it was forward planning. The, the, a lot of these think tanks, the CFR and stuff like that, does um, the Council on Foreign Relations and um, the WF, the World Economic Forum, and all the guys that meet in Davos. A lot of these, um, the RAND organization, um, the Bill and Hewlett Fund, um, uh, Melinda Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, all these guys, um, the Ford Foundation, they all have think tanks that do forward planning. And nobody looks at them. You can go on the CFR's website and you can see them giving the marching orders to all these, you know, apparatchiks and up and coming totalitarians. Um, and if you read them, if you if you read the journal of the CFR, um, they're all guys from like Yale and Harvard and stuff. Just and they they speak their mind, and it's extraordinary. And one of the extraordinary things is if you actually follow this literature, you can see it all rolls out. <laughs> what they say happens. You know, five years later, just they discuss it there, and then it happens. And then so you can see the Rockefeller Foundation one was interesting because they gave these uh, I think six scenarios of you know of where we'd be now, and they they gave the the one that all the activists want we all go you know we have a world uh that's in agreement this kind of amicable thing basically carl sagan's thing when when he carl sagan at the end of his testimony at congress in 1985 he said we need the world to be really amicable to su to survive what's coming in a way that it isn't now and so uh the, that group of goody two scientists in particular in that they wanted consensus the ipcc thing was all designed for that and so they uh they expected the world to pull together 
to address all these problems. Now, that never happened. There was no will to do it. And so we never went to this scenario. I can't remember what the, it was called, the happy, you know, the sunshine scenario. Now, it was named something like the sunshine can, uh, scenario. And you assume, well, that's obviously the one that they were saying, the foundation was, was advocating for the sunny future where everybody works together. We all get, you know, transition to green energy and stuff like that. Well, no. We're in the scenario that they call lockstep. And lockstep is all brutal, you know, a fragmented world, brutal shutdowns, totalitarian regimes, uh, ma massive um, militarization against populations that are, you know, unrest, ecotage, all of these things. It's actually absolutely where we are. You know, well, why didn't they go for the sunshine one? And it's in one of the lines. The reason why they thought the sunshine one was abhorrent was it said, you know, national governments and the power brokers of today would have to give up their power. And what it said, the lock, lockstep one was the only one where they clung on to power. So, of course, they took that one. And that, that's not obvious. You'd say, well, this is a shitty scenario it's not for you. For them, it's the best one because it's the one where they hang on to power. And that's all they cared about. So, in code... You know, if you read it, you, you think I'm a li liberal and you want it all, you know, sugar and spice. But they're not liberals. They just want to hang on to their power. So they chose lockstep and that's what we're in. So very interesting to go back and, and look at all of those. Um, but yeah, they, they, they lay it out because they, they do despise you. I mean, it's I saw this when I was a kid. And, and in fact, I think I even seen Downton Abbey things. I'm, I'm, I'm remarkably impressed by Downton Abbey because it was so accurate to the world I knew. I knew that the, what they were saying, they got details right. And one of the remarkable details is their relationship to the serving staff at the dinner table, which I find was remarkable because it was the same as us, is, is we would discuss subjects that would be about, you know, the coming revolution and whether we'd be murdered in our beds and stuff while people were serving us the people we were, the black people we were talking were serving us and we used to pretend that they were deaf and dumb as if they didn't go to the kitchen and say like did you hear what those fucks just said <laughs> which is of course what they did but we we didn't think of that, that. we thought of them as kind of as if they can't understand us as if we're speaking a foreign language. And they did, had episodes in Downton Abbey where they had exactly that. There was one where the butler, they were talking about, you know, the, the masses and, you know, whether they would rise up. And um, and then the I think the butler um, snapped a glass. You know, he got so frustrated, he snapped a glass in his hand because they were talking about the Bolsheviks and stuff. And, and he was a big patriot. But it was... You know, that, that is how they think of it. I raise it because they think they, they can talk in front of us in open forum because we're so dumb. Here's the thing. We are. We are, we are so stupid. The sheep are so damn stupid that they can speak. They've known forever that they can speak openly in front of the children because the children are that fucking dumb. <laughs> the, children, the children just can't believe their ears and then they, they're not really listening. And so, but all the information is there at your fingertips if you if you just bother to to listen. So you you can hear everything. You can hear what state the Titanic is. You can you can hear how how deep the water is and the hold, how close we are for the you know the water closing over the deck. They don't hide it. They just trust that you're not listening, and no one is. Who has time for this shit? <laughs> and anybody that runs around and says, "Hey, look." Look what they're doing in that. They, they, they're pariah because they, they're telling the people bad news. And, you know, you know, people are looking for things that make them feel good. So they have automatic protection saying that, you know, oh, this is very, very dark. And say, well, as soon as you said it's dark, nobody's going to listen. But the, the, you can push it, push it over the edge, right? Because... Uh, the rumor mill is big, and so the thing I think what what we should do now is with the extinctionality is try and push um, push the line that it's it's just try and make the whole thing go viral 
and try try and you know let as many people as possible um, kind of you know, shove it down their throat that this this is something you you, you need to confront and even if you decide that it's complete bullshit uh, you'll never quite look at the same, the world the same again the thing that anything that rattles people's certainty is good um, because it's uh, from so many ways but the yeah, the thing is that people think the world is, is very stable, it's very robust, it's very predictable. And the exact opposite is true. You know, even the scientists, the climate scientists, geologists, they're staring it right in the face that the Earth is, you know, it's nonlinear, it's highly unstable and exquisitely sensitive. And they don't believe it. They think it's robust and this stuff is like, man, you can see that it's, it's sensitive. It's written right there in front of you. Um, but they, they think you can do anything to this planet and it just bounces back, you know, love lock and stuff. You've done a tremendous disservice to everybody saying, no, this is a self-correcting system. It's like, yeah, <laughs> like a spinning top. Yeah, and, and people believe also believe that it, it can't come and stuff. They, they believe the really dark things, you know, like, Total annihilation of life, hot ass earth or something, or impossible. Why? Ah, because it's just such a thing. <laughs> so, like, it's happened before. It's in the climate record, damn it. <laughs> so, is it look at the planets next. Look at Venus. What the ha happened to Venus? It's like, you know, you think we couldn't be Venus? It's like, you know, you, you think there, there wasn't a population on Venus that didn't, you know, didn't say, oh, you know, this could never happen to us. Venus is very robust. <laughs> it's like, it might well have been. So, so people are too complacent. They're too conservative. Um, they're too sure of themselves. And that's, that's the hubris. That's, that's the hubris that the Atlanteans are supposed to have been wiped out for. <laughs> so anything that undermines people's certainty and belief. That, that's why I keep on going on about Kings North these days, but you see, that, that kind of thing is fucking dangerous. That is pure evil, what he's doing there. Um, with, with he's flirting with Christianity. And stuff. First of all, it's a lie. And second of all, it's it's uh, opiates, it's comfort. And, and any he's selling it. He's selling his opiates to people. And I wish he'd just shut the fuck up. Because the, he's, you know, if everybody is smug, happy, and saved, uh, we're, we're in so much shit. The, we're better off that people are terrified, you know, worried, uncertain, and believe nothing, and, and, and no one. Then you're in good shape. Then, then you can find, uh, find your mates, and it's all about mutual support. Right? The only people that... <laughs> look, the only people that survive the flippening are people that are mutualists, right? Okay, it's easy to be an individualist if you think everything's stable. But it, it's only people that get through are the mutualists, right? So I want to go into, I hope, Sophie, I, I hope you don't feel resistant about going into these scenarios to survive the flipping because they, I think they're really useful for, for you know, getting people prepped. In, oh in no, not at all. Not at all. I 100% I agree with you. I mean, I think that uh, yeah, we were taught. We actually no. We 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 need to talk about these things. And uh, no, 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 not at all. Go ahead. Okay. okay well, well, so so yeah. So let's go through it in 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 detail. Well, I mean, starting now and doing it for for a long time. Um, make make a ritual out of it. But uh, I'll give you an example. Okay, let's take practical examples. So, so I was trying to say that I, the way I see it, and please come up with your own theories, because the more the merrier, it's a it's great discussion point. But uh, the way I see it is you've got three things to survive. You've got to survive the flipping. Then you survive, have to survive severe cold and volcanic winter for maybe five to 15 years. And then you have to survive uh, real heat, um, maybe hot house earth. So from minus 15, you probably have to go to six degrees above today. Um, and, nuclear, and, and nuclear power station. 
Yeah, maybe radiation too. So the radiation is long term, and I think the radiation. I think the only thing you can do is stay away from power stations and and work now to stop them building more. Um, but you don't want to be downwind of a power station. The most, uh, nuclear power station. Most of the nuclear power stations are in the northern hemisphere. It'll take quite a long time for radiation to get down to the southern hemisphere. Um, so the Hadley cells and stuff keep the atmosphere quite contained and dust contained. There are models. You can go and look at how aerosols circulate. And uh, the NASA has some models. Active models. So all of this stuff, you can find out a hell of a lot and, and model a hell of a lot. One of the things you need to find out is uh, where the droughts are in the cold and the heat. And you'll, you'll, be, you'll be surprised. So, so the middle of continents is a very bad place to be because of the temperature ranges. So it's, it's the range of temperature that kills all vegetation. So you, you were, I, I did post one of the, these things where um, they, the models uh, actually showed pretty much what uh, Mount Pinatubo actually did. So the cooling matched. And you, you say, like, uh, one of the good places to be is <laughs> where I am right now. Europe is not bad. Um, the after, after the volcanic winter, the, the Arctic will get very hot. And I, I've often very, been very suspicious of Putin and all this drive for the Arctic. So all, all this um, mobilization for the Arctic, it looks like crazy shit. It's like, if you know the Arctic is going so quickly, you know, how, why do this neo-colonial grab for the Arctic? And the thing is, I think they're thinking post-apocalypse. So, so uh, you, you probably want to stay away from the Arctic for, you know, the, for the action. But then afterwards, in the, the heat and stuff, you probably, when the heat hits, about a few years later, you probably want to head from, for the Arctic. So you must think in terms of movement. So you can't hunker down. So anyway, I'm talking about strategies. The, the preppers and the guys that go into a bunker is like, those guys are doomed. So, so even, even the... Even the military guys that want to go down in the Fort Cheney and have nuclear batteries and have plants that they grow under artificial light and stuff, those guys are not going to be in good shape because they have to come out at some stage. Right? You mentioned also... something this morning that was very interesting in that line. Sorry to bulge in, but it just came into my... You know, you were saying that there was on islands on the Pacific and other places, there are little huts that are built by probably sailors who just leave a place, a shelter, so that they can have a place to stay. And I think in, in this kind of mentality scenario um, making that we're doing there, I think, and, and the fact that we need to be more or less nomadic or at least semi-nomadic if, if an event like that happens, I think it would be very interesting to think in terms of having, like, you know, when you're a kid and you build a base, you know, you know those kind of little shelters that are there for you, but for others too, they're on a path. They, you know, and they, I think those would be part of a, a very interesting thing to include in networks and underground networks that people know and not, not the bunker mentality, but all, on the opposite, actually, a kind of an open place uh, where you know that there are different options in depending on what scenario unfolds. So, so this is where I'm going. You, you're preempting where I want to take all of this. So this is a vision I see for the extinction ID. And that you, you have a worldwide network of people that have the same egregore, think the same way. And you, know, you basically, you, our aim is to survive this, uh, but you hedge your bets. You, everybody is around the world with different strategies and different um, view, views of, of how this unfolds. But you, you don't, you're not secretive about the fact that, you know, this is where you are, this is what you're doing. Now, that's absolutely contrary to the prepper mentality. If you say, look at uh, Canadian prepper or any one of those kind of guys, they always think in terms of keeping people away. So they, uh, there was one horrific ep episode that shocked even the Canadian prepper YouTube guy. Um, where he said, you know, what would you do in these scenarios? If uh, some guy comes to the door asking for food, he uh, looks a bit like an anarchist. I think he actually used the A word. 
And he said, you know, you've seen the guy around, maybe eyeing your daughter or something like that. And then he comes to the door. You think he might be sussing out the, you know, maybe scouting the reconnoitre on the on your property uh, to maybe do a, how, how do you handle it? Um, do you give him food? I think uh, it was astonishing. I think like 25% of his viewership said they would give him food and poison him. He said that wasn't a very good strategy because the guys probably got mates and they're going to come to you. <laughs> but just that attitude, I would write those guys off with an F. They're not going to survive. They, they preppers and then they, they, I would put them as high right at the top of the list of people that will not survive somewhere close to people in ICUs and stuff like that. And the reason is if, if you're thinking that way of survival, I can tell you, you cannot survive with absolute certainty. What a lot of the guys said, well, I would just rack the slide, stick a gun in the guy's face and tell him to bug off. That too, the, even the Canadian prepper guy said that not, not what you want to do because you've just announced that you have resources and stuff to protect and stuff like that. So it's like, how are you supposed to survive those, those situations? And I'll tell you, it's basically you let people know, you feed them. So you say, well, if I have a little stash in like Panama or Guatemala or somewhere and I have a little cave and a little bug out thing and I've sucked it out and I think I can survive a flipping there and stuff, publish it. So, but you say, well, but, you know, you might get 200 refugees on the door at the door and you, you might only have food for your family for like, you know, three weeks. I say, give the 200 people the food, invite them in. Give them the food. You will be better off. 200 people can look after each other. Say, I have food. It's you know only a little bit. And, that, and say, if, if, if 200 people make it across the fucking ocean to your bug you want those people. Those fuckers are survivors. <laughs> those 200 people will look after each other. They will survive. They have pretend survival potential. So do not think in terms of turning people away from the door. If, if you go down and collapse and you give away your last crust of bread, that's fucking good. Be prepared to give it away and starve to death. What's more likely to happen is they will reciprocate. So you've got to get into the mode of reciprocate. So yeah, like absolutely something. Yeah, like my thought with the survival is like it's not up to me. It's up to other people really and circumstance yeah like the, that, the whole that's a indiv very good attitude the, the yeah. individualist idea i just completely disagree with because you know we're social animals like if you look at like you know primates and wolves and stuff they do not survive well alone and so like honestly like it gets me thinking about the fates and stuff it's like um yeah it's just my survival will be dependent mostly on other people because <laughs> I sure shit don't know how to survive without, you know, the the system. So and I'm all for sharing. Like yes. if 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 some stranger, like even if a neo-Nazi knocked at my door, I'd share food with them. Like, you know, I can see beyond that bullshit. They're people just like me. Oh, yeah. I mean, if he's a well-armed neo-Nazi, uh, you probably want him as as your mate because <laughs> yeah. he can probably, probably fend off for the, you know, the saber-toothed cats or something that suddenly make a comeback. But yeah, you, you know, the, this you 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 will not be able to predict um, what to prepare for, right? So, you know, you don't know that there are going to be plagues of king rats or locusts or, you know, maybe the polar bears will, will thrive in the new environment and terrorize the landscape. In, in those cases, you, you really want a tribe. There's the ways of how we've survived as humans is our tribal instinct. So all this thing about, oh, we must all care and share and, you know, can't we have a united loving world and, you know, imagine with the Beatles and stuff. All that stuff is poison. You, you really want tribes and disparate tribes. The fact that they beat each other up occasionally and do raiding parties is like, that's how we survived. It's, it's called hedging your bets. <laughs> so, you know, that you've got to embrace our evil side. It's we're not broken, right? We're not broken, you know, people that this liberal dream that we can all be pacifists and, and get on. It's it's doomed. It's a doomed um, ideal, and you wouldn't want it. 
you wouldn't want to live in that world, that syrupy saccharine world where it's like horrible, horrible world, man. It's like yeah. that's not us. Yeah, it's like that. I see. I see this uh, saying that's always like uh, misinterpreted. It's that one where you know the two wolves are fighting in everyone's heart, and which one wins? The one you feed. It's like no, you have to feed both of them because if you don't feed the dark one, he will come after you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So all these kind of get get all this water world and Mad Max and stuff scenarios out of the way is. Um, you know, if you go and look at a good collapse scenario, 1174, there was a nice collapse. All the, you know, the guys that really made out like bandits were bandits. <laughs> they were the sea peoples. So go and look at the sea peoples. The, all the states collapsed except maybe Egypt and possibly Syria. But uh, they all collapsed under some great cat cataclysm that people are not really sure what they are, but it could have been volcanism. So just have a look but well, if, the, you, if the, you listen if you listen at the moment some what some uh, liberals are saying and um, in the media um they are absolutely afraid of tri tribalism they are actually denouncing tribalism this new fear that you know these new things that are appearing they 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 don't like it and and it, whether right or left i've heard a lot of talks where that word is is demonized totally and uh, yeah, so they they know that that's where, that's that's the antidote to globalism. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it's um yeah they're just the liberals love their chains like you guys said yeah they don't like seeing people break away from the the mind control. Well, we're too monolithic in terms of genetics and culture. So we have a monoculture and and we mono genetics. So so. We, we're too closely related genetically. We went through a population bottleneck, I think, at the last flipping. And, and so we don't have enough genetic diversity. So we need diversity. So they all say about, you know, celebrating diversity and stuff. Well, it's like, yeah, but they, they want to subsume diversity. So they, they want to celebrate diversity by, by knackering it, by basically emasculating it and and quarantining it and making it safe so that it's, you know, oh, you can be different in as long as it's not threatening to the whole system. And so like, no, you've got to allow people their differences. It's one of the things we actually agree with the far right on. Don't agree with much with the far right, but the, the, the far right in general, the, um, they, they kind, of, kind of say, you know, we, we don't deny people their differences, we just want them separate. Now, that's hor horrendous to to liberals on this trip that we all go you know progress on the wrong right side of history and stuff which is all bogus you want people like that in in tribes the reason why we survive diseases is because the diseases dry you know um wiped out a, only a tribe or two in this local little conurbation but if you're too connected and and your genetics is not diverse enough You'll be you'll be wiped out by disease. That's what's happening now. That's what the the lesson that nobody's taking from this pandemic. What the what the pandemic's trying to tell you is that too many people, they're too closely connected and they they're moving too fast. So it's saying slow down, segregate, tribalize, and have more barriers. It's it's kind of the anti anti anarchist thing. And anarchists say, well, you know, we should have no borders. Yeah, because people need to to move around, but we shouldn't have no tribes. Right? That's a bit, a bit of a mistake. That's not a good good lesson from from Paleolithic times. That you know from. The, well, the nomadic okay. people are very are very uh, bent on maintaining their tribes among them. The the various cultures and the one I know particularly the Bedouins. Um, they they have kept them through thousands of years, even though they are nomadic, even though they are uh, a people. They're they, they've kept this structure, and they're totally lawless. They're totally without any respect for authority, police, borders, anything like that. But the structure of the tribe is is their is their lifeline. Yeah, or through. Throughout human cultures, in, in all cultures around the world, there are things like they, they have uh, strict laws of moiety and, and you know, who you can marry and stuff. 
So the law of, laws of Moti are, it's, are amazing if you've never come across them. It's um, in uh, um, Austral Asian tribes and Papua New Guinea and stuff, they have these laws of Moti, which they, they're incredibly complex about who you can marry in terms of relatives. Um, and so they they look at the patterns and the, the guys the guys know the patterns instinctively, but it took mathematicians to work out what they were doing. And then, you know, these ancient people from like 60,000 years ago figured out how to make sure you have the most genetic diversity. And that's what the laws of Moti are, are, are to do, is to make sure that you match people that are genetically most, most distant from each other. And so incredible ritual that I, I don't think the guys know themselves the reasons for it they just know that it's super important and um, it's it's the way we've survived disease the, the whole point of you know sexual dimorphism and stuff is to protect you from disease it's to to provide a an ever moving target for diseases so part of the reason why I would speculate and this is not official this is not I don't think uh, epidemiologists and stuff would agree, but my theory is that the reason why we've got such a long break from when we should have been having, you know, ever since globalism, globalism, globalism started in about 1900, right? The first globalism. We've had an amazing run of luck from epidemics, which epidemiologists can't explain. Well, I think I can explain it in that you get uh, a reprieve for a while because of the genetic diversity, so that people are tribal enough and genetically diverse enough that a novel virus can't actually make headway against this novel immune system and immune response in, in foreign places. So there's this kind of uh, foreign immunity. And then as people travel and you get mixed marriages and the, the gene pool gets um, blended, then the diseases can make headway. So, so now the, the world population is becoming thoroughly blended, so, so much so that anthropologists are seeing a closing window on looking at Earth's genetic history because it's being stirred up with, um, you know, just since the invention of one trip invented the jet or the passenger airline. So since the invention of the passenger airline, there's been such a mix-up of genes. It started slowly in the 1900s with ships and stuff. But the, the, I think that is... is uh, stirred up the, the gene pool and blended it to the point that some virus can, like a SARS virus, can take can take root and, and get a clear run as if it's just taking a run through it. So, it's, in other words, the cost of a global village is what is is um, annihilation by pandemic. And what kept uh, us going for you know two or three hundred thousand years is is the fact that we were in villages that. Yeah, you know, if they were exposed to a deadly disease, the disease died out in one or two villages. It couldn't actually spread. And what can happen now is it can spread, and when it gets to a new place, it says, "Ah, oh, I've seen your your T cell makeup. I've seen your genetics before. It's just like that, you know, the guy in, in like Japan or something is like, you know, and you say like, well, I'm American Japanese. Yeah, same genetics. Anyway, I've got you. I, I can read your number. So again. This is, by the way, a lesson also for authoritarians, is, is you have to escape diseases the same way you escape authoritarians, and it's by being random. So the more random our genetics is, the more random our behavior is, the, and the more you know, heterogeneous it is, the, the more chance you have of evading uh, pathogens, and, and the state is a pathogen. So the state is a a hegemon and a pathogen, uh, just like the virus. The, the two are remarkably similar when you actually look at them. And so really the, the government is really fighting it, competition from from uh, from the virus. They're ba basically the same. And, and you can see they're the same. Look, look at Big Pharma. Big Pharma is on, on the virus side. It's making money out of it. The, the virus is making, making uh, copies of itself. And um, Big Pharma is making copies of itself. So... The two are in cahoots, they're allies. Um, but, you know, the, the, the way around them is the same around uh, totalitarians, is to be random. You see, what they, they're, in a, they're in a competition to make sure that they can make you predictable um, and then controlled. So 
if you if they do any of these things like passports or any one of the measures, you want to make sure that you make it difficult and you're random. So you don't fit in, you make it very hard for the, for them. So everybody must be an exception. Uh, they want everybody to to be conform. So the way around is to be an exception. The more exceptions they have, the, the more expensive it comes to run. It's all about making the, the system cheap to run. So all of these things are to run, uh, you know, things run uh, totalitarian authority as cheap as you can. Uh, and, so, and so the point of view for, for rebels and reactionaries against it is to raise the price of their totalitarianism and their violence. So the, que the easiest thing is to get you to be self-centering. You see, what they're doing now is they're getting companies and corporations to do their dirty work for them. They're getting restaurants to police, you know, uh, jab status and stuff like that. So you see that that you want um, you want everything to be ambiguous. You want the restaurateurs, everybody to to try and be exceptions, and eventually they have to do their own dirty work. They can't you know rely on other people. But the cheapest and easiest form of control is violence and terror. So that's why they use it. They terrorize you with fines. They terrorize you with uniforms. They terrorize you with brutality. And all of it is to make the authoritarianism cheaper. So you just have to find a way of making it more expensive. So if, if they put some guy in a uniform, make sure that he runs around doing useless shit all the time. So they, they always say this. They say this to, to XR. They say, you're wasting police time. There's knife crime in London. You know, these police could be actually policing useful stuff like knife crime. And no one ever says like, no, I, I want to waste police crime. I want to make policing very, very expensive. And yeah, the more knife crime, the better. Because basically it's costing the government money. And if the government, the government has to raise money, they're raising it, they're parasites. So they raise money with taxes. The more taxes they squeeze out of the population, the, the more pissed off the population gets. And the sooner they revolt. So there are two ways they tax you, right? Inflation and raw taxation. So, so, you know, they nickel and dime you with fees and all of this stuff. And, the, <clears throat> and then the inflation. So they're taxing us heavily with both. And, and so you're seeing the now, you know, currency inflation is turning into uh, price inflation in, in the shops. All of this is good. All of this is making the public disaffected and causing a, a wedge between the authoritarians and the people. Now, that wedge has to be driven as deep as possible because when the shit hits the fan, inevitable, unavoidable, you want those authoritarians to be as weak, ineffectual, and distant as possible. So. <laughs> but, yeah. So, yeah, like going back to the mutualism of survivalism, unless anybody's got something they wanted to say. Yeah, it's like you said uh, in the Eastern meeting, like if the government steps in, they're going to screw up your ability to do mutual aid. They're not going to let you do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an act of resistance. Every, you know, self-reliance and um, who wrote that? Emerson? <coughs> See, that's subversive. Uh, the, the government needs you to be reliant on them. It's exactly as they say in the V movie, is the chancellor says, you know, they need to be reminded why they need us. And that is the truest thing. The, that is the, the gold standard for every totalitarian. Is they need, it's, it's the mafia, it's the Cray twins, all of these guys. The, they, they need the public to need them. Right? The Nazis went to excessive trouble to make sure that the public needed them. It's an act of resistance, just like, a, you know, they need to be paternalistic and maternalistic. But it's an act of resistance to be independent. So if you, if you can remove any one of the intermediaries between you and the sources of, of your survival, that's an act of resistance. If you can take people out of the chain of the stuff that you need, like think how many people are in the chain for your food. The next time you put a bit of food in your mouth, Ask yourself, how many intermediaries were there that touched this food? 
if, if it's processed food, it's an extraordinary amount. You have a look at the fucking packaging. You Don't be surprised. If the raw, raw materials were grown in Peru. They were sent for packaging in Malaysia. And they, they came to you. They were, you know, you went to a retail store, like a distribution center. Then Vons picked them up. It was, so they, they, you know, they were shipped by probably Costco in China. In a, in a container. They, they went to a refrigeration, refrigeration plant. They went to a mass distribution place. They went to a local distribution center, and then they went to a store. And then you picked them up. And you think, okay, there's the guys that grew the thing. There's the guys that, you know, how many farmers and laborers were on that farm for that produce? The guys that made the packaging and work in a plastic factory. The guys that ship the raw materials out to Malaysia, the guys that packed it, the guys that put the, the label on, the guys that guys, you know, that ran the ship, that got it to you. There's an army of people between you and this fucking pear sauce in this, in this little container. So you say, the more people there in that chain, the more fragile it is and the more likely they are to go away. So, you know, the, the state needs that long, long chain to be intact. You, and they need it as long as possible. You see, if everybody is enmeshed in that chain, then, then they're holding people literally in chains. Now, if the person can get to their own pairs immediately out of the garden, they're no intermediaries. The government's in trouble because you don't need them, right? And if you don't need them, then the whole thing falls apart. So they're continually doing stuff to make sure that you need them. That's the problem with socialized medicine. All of them, they're all trying to find excuses. That's the problem with the left, is they're licensing the state to, to be an intermediary. And they actually want to be mothered. They want diaper socialism, and they want to be mothered. Then they wonder why they get put in gas chambers. It's like the na they called national socialists not because it's name only, it's because that's what they fucking are. National socialists are national socialists. And they got to the gas chambers. How? Through socialism, right? Why? I, I just, it's remarkable that they're still staunch anarchists that think it's compatible with socialism. Anarchism is not compatible with socialism. Socialists are communists or national socialists. That's all. That's all there is. They are intermediaries. There, there is no way. To, socialism is not mutualism. Socialism is the state apparatus making sure it's an intermediary between you and the stuff you need. And so the more the, the intermediaries you have, the more fragile the system, the more it has to be maintained, protected, and taxed. And so the, it's a burden. It's a huge burden, and it doesn't distribute wealth. So all, you know, it's like the National Socialists. All these guys, go, out, go and look at Schindler's list. He makes out like the government, like a bandit, because he has cheap socialized workers, right? You, you don't distribute wealth through the state. The state isn't capable of distributing wealth because it has to grow. If it starts distributing wealth, it'll, it'll hamper its growth prospects. If, the, if its growth prospects are are hampered in any way, the GDP goes down and the government will be overthrown or it'll be overrun by some other state next door. So it just doesn't fucking work. you got to get rid of this ideology. This state system doesn't work. Industrialism doesn't work. Socialism is a child of industrialism. It's a, it's a redheaded stepchild that cannot work. So you've got to get rid of all of this shit in, in an emergency fashion. So you should be praising the, you know, everybody laments the wrong stuff. In Britain, they all lament the passing of the NHS and stuff. Well, you should lament, you shouldn't lament the passing of the NHS. You should celebrate it. And then don't, don't celebrate the, well, immediately you're going to get privatized medicine, which is w much worse, by the way. <laughs> but you don't want privatized medicine and you don't want socialized medicine. They, they, both of those are intermediaries. And if you if you need the industrial system to support you, you're going to be in trouble. We're in overshoot, damn it. This 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 game is not going to go on for much longer. You've just been given you know a thousand fireball warning by this pandemic, and you've just seen the supply shocks. So the the you know this is the this is fair warning 
of what's coming. What's wrong with people that they, they want more government, more social media, just showing you what happens. The supply shocks are because of the intermediaries. You see, the intermediaries are handing all these goods down this long chain, hand to hand, like a like a you know bucket brigade. So economists learn in in college that those bucket brigades, you can break a healthy bucket brigade just by just by social just by psychology. Just if if there's ever a panic or there's a, ever a hiccup in supply and demand is you, you get oversupply and uh, a hiccup that goes all the way down to the manufacturer. The manufacturer overproduces, and then they can't warehouse the stuff and they go bust. That, that's taught to economic students that supply shocks and, and stuff so can be fatal for no reason. There was a supply shock in 2008 that was unnoticed in the rice market. And they, it almost brought down all Asian governments left and right. And it was entirely psychological. There was panic, broke down for no reason in like Vietnam and India. And then soon all these governments started hoarding rice. And there was a run on the rice market. A, there was no rice shortage. But it was it was just a supply shock. It's just like, you know, a run on toilet paper during a pandemic. Well, yes, during so, the beginning of the lockdowns, there was a there was a shortage of flour in the in the supermarkets because people had thought you know won't get bread we we'll buy flour etc and there wasn't a shortage of flour there was a shortage of of little packets of flour it was the packaging that was that was the problem because they were not prepared for people to rush on that there was you could get plenty of big bulk uh, products from various places but it was just the packaging mm. One of the things that I find very remarkable is I, I would have predicted that more companies would have gone bust. So they, they're keeping companies afloat by just pumping money into them. But you see, one of the things they describe in those supply shocks is what takes companies down is that a lot of these, especially retail companies, they're running on very thin margins like Vons and stuff as Albertsons and all these, you know, Sainsbury's and stuff. They have very thin margins, like 3% and stuff like that. So, so what happens is they get a signal from the market saying that for some accidental reason, there's a big demand, say demand double suddenly. Now, what happens is they all uh, carry in, uh, uh, you know, uh, excess inventory. So they, they send orders up the chain so that, the, you know, the, the supermarket Try, it says, oh, we ran out of uh, flour in a day. So it's like, okay, well, we need a week's supply. So they put in an, an order for five times what they normally do. Then that goes to the, the wholesaler. The wholesaler then says, okay, we, we warehouse five. Everybody's ordering five times as much. So we order five. And so you've got 25 times as much ordered by the, the, the wholesaler. Then it goes all the way down the, the chain. So you eventually get to the manufacturer and they go like, oh, well, I better go and borrow some money and tool up because now I've got like 100 times the order. If they do that, they're going to be in severe trouble because the, as soon as the supply shock is gone, then they've bought inventory and hired people and you know laid out capital uh, expecting a ramp up in production that never comes. Then, then you know, eventually the excess filters down the chain and you know everybody has takes takes a fucking year for all this excess inventory to filter through um to to the to the store and the end of the chain where the consumer picks it up in the meantime the manufacturers baffled they say like how did we go from like a hundred times what we normally do to zero and so that's what kills them because they can't survive until the supply chain renormalizes so they go bust and then you have a real problem because then, you know, the original manufacturer or some guy in the chain is out of business. Then everybody's really fucked. And that, that hasn't happened so far. But by rights, it should. At the moment, it's all just, you know, containers and logistics and a bit of a muddle. But yeah, they've managed to paper over the cracks in the capital markets and, and the fact that people have not, uh, you know, they, they should be all ramping up and for for supply and over and and doing all this excess which will work its way through the system so we haven't seen all that yet and i think that you know i'll be amazed if it doesn't come but you should be seeing 
loads of places going bankrupt, far more than now. And then if you remember that all of this house of cards is predicated on the derivatives market, that's five quadrillion, right? So five quadrillion in derivatives, it's like $30 on every dollar, real dollar in the market on side bets. Those side bets are all gonna fail. So, so there should be a massive financial collapse. I haven't seen it yet, but you, you know, this Jenga tower is teetering like crazy. So I, I can't see us getting through this without precipitating the financial collapse because the financial collapse came before COVID, right? Just repeat that over a thousand times. The, the financial collapse that they started QE for was in January. Pandemic started in February at most, maybe March in 2020. So don't forget that. That they, 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 they were unrelated, right? So don't, don't think all the problems you're seeing in the global markets are of, uh, related to the pandemic. They, they exacerbated by it, but they started before. So, so that alone is enough for conspiracy. It's just so fucking convenient. It's, it's so convenient, it ranks right Yeah, that was the crisis in the repo markets, wasn't it? Um, the year before. And then, uh, yeah, all the bank lending. There's a banking crisis. There, there, there is a fiscal crisis going down. The, the Deutsche Bank and stuff is bankrupt. All of the banks are, are bankrupt. So they, so far, they've managed to patch it up with extraordinary, with absolutely unprecedented in the history of the world, uh, quantitative easing. But that quantitative easing has to be reflected in, 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 um, in inflation uh, at some point. And so people are going to be devastated. So, yeah, this, uh, you know, this, I don't think the story winds up smoothing out. It's a giant Ponzi scheme. And, you, you know, you, as Mike Kaiser says, you can't taper a Ponzi scheme. And so the, I think this, this might be the end of the Ponzi scheme. Uh, but, yeah, the, yeah, the financial thing is, is more important than, than any of this. Everybody's whistling through the graveyard. But, you know, it, this... This is so convenient for the banks that it ranks right up with um, Donald Rumsfeld um, admitting to Congress that uh, the Pentagon lost um, over a trillion dollars that went unaccounted for in the in the uh, military budget. That was the day before 9/11. <laughs> so Donald Rumsfeld was testifying about a trillion dollar loss, which was going to be the biggest story in the world. And the next day, this 9-11 was like, and nobody mentioned that trillion dollars ever again. It's like, whoa, is Donald Rumsfeld the luckiest fuck that ever walked on this planet? Or is that just too much of a coincidence? But anyway, the same applies to the banks. It's like right when they were on the ropes, they had this, this bloody reprieve, absolute reprieve. It's like, come on, dude. <laughs> this is not, oh, come on. Like... The, the next month is like, oh, come on. You just, just come on. It's like, you, you, you just, how can you not be a conspiracy theorist? I just don't get it. It's all too Yeah, weird. I got to, I, I got to admit that the, uh, when the pandemic started and I was pretty early doors on realizing how big it was going to be, I must admit the first thing I thought, because I sort of had one foot in trying to sort of just as a side hobby, just following financial news and the gold bugs and all of the things you've talked about, that I had a hunch straight away. I actually jokingly said, oh, you know what this is? This is to get rid of all the old people because they can't afford their pensions, you know? <laughs> but, I, I mean, you know, I, it is incredible how convenient it all is. I'm not, you know, I, I'm somewhere in the middle. I think there's a, yeah. It's definitely with the conspiracy theories it's healthy to be like there's some truth in some things but you don't want to be completely one side but it is just crazy like when you and when you listen to a lot of the people like Catherine Austin Fitz and a lot of the kind of libertarian real money guys a lot of them don't say it so much some of them do some of these YouTubers and things but you can tell they're connecting dots that most people just 
haven't got a Scooby Doo about. Um, and it, yeah, there's, I don't know. Yeah, I don't want to say there's like some grand plan, but it's like they they must have top shelf plans that they go, oh, look, here's a crisis. Right now we can you know roll this out and yeah, that's what I say. Yeah, it's it's hard to pin down, so you don't want to get too tinfoil a hat, but it's it's worth just keeping at the back of your mind because it the universe does conspire to be amazingly like a badly written play. <laughs> you know, basically you think who wrote this shit? This is completely unconvincing. It's such a hack. Um, so it does the it does you know, there are amazing coincidences and stuff in history, but I always think your first uh, you should always go for conspiracy before coincidence because that's what history shows. It's just if if you go and uncover history, that you see that it's just wall to wall conspiracies. And, uh, you know, go, you, you, got, you need to do a thorough uh, look at history. It doesn't, doesn't pay to look at history superficially. If, if you do a thorough look, and I mean, you try to put yourself in the sandals of somebody that, in that day and time and try and understand what they're thinking and, uh, and why they do the, the shit that they do. And eventually you get to a point where you really, really feel you can understand what it was like to be at a time and place. And what always turns out was they would never, ever have believed the truth of what we now teach in this orthodox history. The people at the time would not have believed you. They would have utterly dismissed you as a nutcase if you had told them what now kids are taught as standard in school. So all, all the stuff that goes down, people just, just don't believe it. It doesn't fit with their worldview. So that's worth remembering. So it's, what I'm saying is it's not always possible to nail down what the conspiracy is. But you must never, ever lose sight of the fact that there is a conspiracy. You might not be able to tell what it is, but it's absolutely the liberal view that there's no conspiracy is wrong. It's absolutely demonstrable by just going back in history and saying, like, you know, they all thought there was no conspiracy, and now we take it as red. Just everything, every fucking thing. Is, I mean, just it's a long litany. You just go and look at their sinking of the Lusitania or look at the, you know, the... The, uh, they completely manufactured um, the, the Gulf of Tonkin uh, incident just so they could go to war in Korea. It's, it's like just, uh, you know, over and over again. Just the whole whole of history is just look at uh, the, the murder of Dach Hammarskjöld and stuff, which, by the way, South Africa had a hand in. Um, I mean, yeah, it's just over and over again. South Africa killed Samora Michelle. And the president of Mozambique. All all of these things go down. This the CIA is absolutely rogue uh, organization. It's absolute. You know, it's it's the the B team. You know, the NSA and stuff is worse. But but the CIA is absolutely out of control. And so, yeah, you know, they're. They, um... they, the CIA, I love this saying, um, this abbreviation, one of them is called um, the CIA Capitalism's Invisible Army. That's just the perfect name for a conspiracy right there, which, yeah. Yeah, the, no no president or something can, can cross the CIA. They'll, they'll all tell, they admit it. They, well, they, they, they invented the term conspiracy theory, didn't they? Who was talking about that the other day? Was that us? I don't know, yeah, I heard it, like, they were the guys that set that seed, you know, to sort of say, label anyone that was coming up with other stuff. Yeah, you said that, um, so, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, and to conspire, yeah, you know, what's the definition? It's, you know, it's, it's a group of individuals, you know, getting together and hatching a plan or, you know, to enact some change of some sort or, it, but it's the way it's been you know, seeded in the public's mind. It's like this propaganda word. It's so powerful how the media just grab these and they just pump these labels. And that's such a simple thing, but it, people just immediately just, they hear that and they just associate that with anything that is just whack job. And it's just, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> look, look at uh, Alan Dulleth. And his term in the, in the CIA and all the, the hits they did on Castro and 
uh, like 50, 50 failed attempts. So a lot of the guys like Oliver Stone say, well, you know, the only, one of the arguments against uh, the Kennedy assassination and CIA connection is that, like, the CIA fuck everything up. And Kennedy assassination went flawlessly. So you know, that's, that's that's the one thing that makes people think in the know think it wasn't the CIA because they fuck everything up. But they, I th I think it, you know, they, they definitely had a hand in it, and the Secret Service had a hand in it. But it was, I think it was because it was on, on home soil that they could, they actually did quite a good job. But yeah, they were, Duluth and those people came up with the idea of a conspiracy theory as a pejorative so like anything that's abnormal so it's like but it it gets to the point of ridiculousness so it's like you know oh oh you know oh you're a 9 11 conspiracy theorist because you know like 19 hijackers just taking over four civilian airliners and flying them into buildings is just an everyday occurrence so don't get all woo about it <laughs> it's like where are you coming from it's like this is such an extraordinary thing and they're like you, you, but a, cons a conspiracy behind it is too much for you. It's like you know, what it, it just you know, it's just like no, it's an ordinary fucking Tuesday afternoon. What the fuck are you talking about? Or you nutcase? It's like what? <laughs> What's normal about the Kennedy assassination? It's just so fucking extraordinary. It's, it opens the door to anything, except liberals go boom, ooh, dangerous, scary, shut doors <laughs> because. But you you got to get over that shit because because you, it didn't used to matter in the 60s and 70s. It's kind of academic. But you see, living in these regimes, you have to second guess them. This is what we had to do in South Africa. It's really fucking important because the, the, you, you need to read the government, read what they're doing, read their intentions. And because you, you have to make plans like to get out of the draft and to you know, avoid all these really sucky situations. So you, you need to be well ahead of the game. And they always telegraph, you know, when, when, once you learn to read them, the, the, the thing that stops people reading them is they trust them. But as long as you know that everything they say, they open their mouth, it's bullshit and propaganda. As soon as you yeah, get that, I, you're in the, in the ballpark of actually reading. I, I, yeah, I mean, the most disappointing thing, I think, you know, when you look at now and how the public and everybody is just like so compliant and believing everything that they're told, I think the most frustrating thing is that we saw this all before, you know, years ago with the Snowden revelations, and it was all laid bare, and people didn't bat an eyelid, barely anyone. Yeah, there was a few protests, and, you know, that led to kind of, and then we had the, you know, the Wall Street protests after the financial crisis, but people just kind of, yeah, just didn't really do much in the end it was just like okay I'm just back to click back to reality click back to normal and not that fast and a lot of people just said oh well I'm not a terrorist it doesn't matter I don't mind the government just like looking at everything I do and they're just hoovering up all this data on us like why do you trust them it's just crazy I, I don't understand why people can't see that it's not verbatim what I tell you guys. It's not all truth, you know. It's clearly not. It's a, well, a lot of it's Stockholm syndrome, but I, I believe one of the things, one of the new developments in this story is that uh, what the authoritarians have have come to realize is there's a certain protection in uh, in the more outrageous things are. So, in other words, the more devious, outrageous. Uh, thing that they do, the more uh, people will internalize it, normalize it. So if, if you give people a, a steady feed of outrage, they they uh, get habituated to it. Now everybody expects, so, so there was a time that I think I can even remember where uh, the government tried to avoid scandal. You know, if you look at, say, the Profumo affair, Christine Keeler and Mandy Rice Davis and all of that, the public would be shocked and the governments would fall and people would lose their jobs. What they've been finding over the years is that people, yeah, it, it becomes uh, such a steady stream of outrage that they've normalized outrage and they can move on to the second, second stage. So, so people's emotions have been blunted 
Um, this, this is one of the things that, that Fault is making a huge mistake on. He thinks that, you know, it's, it's we're in the Gandhi era and as when the world sees, you know, kids' heads being broken open and they see blood on the streets and then you will expose the government and, you know, there'll be outrage and people will run onto the streets with uh, this, this moral outrage. Say, so, well, it, there's not a drop of moral outrage left in the public. They've been drained of it systematically. Or just just this deluge of stuff that is morally outrageous. So they've they've normalized evil, and so nobody's going to say this is beyond the pale. Is it? Everybody's going to say, "Well, I knew it was like that." Swipe left, and so this it's far more. They, they they found that out. Sarkov and those guys found that out. I mean, I use I use a technique too, just on XML. If you give people a bar barrage of, of bad news, you, you, you anesthetize them. So it's um, you, you can you numb them, and it's to their advantage because uh, if if they just think oh, this is you know you won't surprise me, it can't you know I believe it can get much worse than this. It's you know that's a, a huge boon. Uh, if they can set that expectation in the population, that's a huge boon to totalitarians. And so they've been using it. They've been using it for, for a while. It was like, put out the bad news. Uh, and so there are no scandals anymore. It's, it's like they found that, you know, look at uh, Prince Andrew and stuff like that and all the stuff with Epstein. And you can't shock anybody with that stuff anymore. So they go, this is great. You know, we can do fucking anything, you know. And so they get to their fuck a pig moment in public. So so where this all ends up is they will eventually get to a thing where, where a sitting prime minister fucks a pig in parliament just to prove to everybody that basically you cannot touch me. I am an untouchable. Why? Who else could fuck a pig in parliament and get away with it? And so that, that's where the emperors went to. That's where the Roman emperors went to. They, they went to a place where we're saying they would deliberately do stuff that was so outrageous to prove to the population that they, they were absolute power. They had absolute power. Because they say, like, here I'm doing the absolute taboo thing, which would make grandma faint, and I'm getting away with it. What are you going to do? And it's like, there. And once the public... You know, doesn't react to that fuck a pig in parliament moment. Uh, that's it. They have absolute and utter control over you. Because there's so, there is no moral outrage left. So then, can you maybe you can tie it up for us? So, if all the outrageous things that are being done do not uh, elicit um, emotion or shock in us, how does that stack up against our um, well, like our ideal for people to resist. If um, nothing shocks us anymore, um, will will resistance just be? How how does that tie up with resisting? If we're not shocked at what's going on, we're just numb and accepting uh, things. No, there. Is, so what? Um, when this happens, you can you can always one up people on shock. So what, traditionally, what happens is in Sun Chu, and and the extinctionality, the flipping, and everything. The the aim is to put people on dead ground. So so what happened in? You see, this this is all stuff that people have known since the beginning of civilization. Is uh, particularly say the Romans got to the stage where uh, the the troops would be dumbstruck um, by uh, an entrenched enemy, say, an intractable enemy. And the, that's where the, the term decimation comes from. Decimation was they would line up uh, all their troops if, if they were defeated, um, and that they would kind of get into a state of helplessness and, and apathy. Uh, the way they would shock them out of it is um, they used this a few times, but the Roman army feared decimation. For sure, what they would line uh, their troops up, uh, pick out every man and execute him, and then send the rest back in a battle, and that that would normally shock them out of it. But the the standard technique is Sun Shu, where you put the troops on dead ground. So, so uh, 
at some point uh, you have to burn the bridges and then people are like, okay, uh, we've got no hope. We, we're dead. You say, yeah, okay, we, we are absolutely dead. We, we, are, we are defeated. We're dead. And say so like, ah, uh, so what are you going to do for the rest of the afternoon? Have tea or wait for them to fuck you up the backside or mutilate you or torture you? Or so like, or do you want to just like um, spike, just stick it to them? And most people will go like, oh, fuck it. If I'm dead, I'm going to take, you know, take one or two down of those fuckers with me. And then that that's, you know, the, the, if, the, if the enemy has an escape route, then they won't fight as hard as people that are on dead ground. So if you put people on, you see, the, the problem with climate change and all of this stuff is people have options. They all say, you know, so the scientists are criminals because they they conspired. Literally, I watched them. I read all in the. I watched them conspire together. They conspired in open forum in Nature and New Scientists, and they had this debate during the fucking eighties and nineties, where they said, you know, how do we communicate this climate and ecological disaster to the public? And there was two schools of camp, uh, two camps, and the, the one school said, well, we're scientists, just tell them the fucking truth. And the other ones were politicians in, in lab coats. And they said, no, all the research shows, and they chump out all the papers where the psychologist shows that if you tell people the truth about the ecological disaster, they get apathetic, and then they, don't, uh, they won't do anything about climate change. So... This was utterly wrong from so many so many angles, but the you know the worst angle is that they went beyond their mandate because they we didn't we didn't pay scientists to be our parents and to manipulate uh, the message. We paid them to do science and report science accurately. They, then they took it on themselves. They conspired in print. They reached a consensus as they could because they're all on the liberal left and they all suck in on the government teat. They reached a very convenient consensus and that's you sell everybody opium. So everything has to be framed in their options. It's never too late. Never stop the hope because if people give up what they told themselves was the science says, psych, psychology, you know, a few psych studies says that if you tell people the truth and they lose hope, then they give up and they don't do any climate action. What The second thing that's completely wrong about this is that it's a false assumption to assume that the, that people do climate action. So it's this, again, this, this liberal, unquestioned liberal piece of horseshit that if people know the truth, they will all come together and we'll all act as a consensus and the consensus will change things and say, that's a fucking lie. No one ever went and questioned that and said, does the consensus translate to a reduction in greenhouse gas, for example? No one did that. To this day, no one has shown what, what the, the Mauna Loa has shown us, that greenhouse gas does not go down as consensus goes up. So as people awareness went up of greenhouse gases and all of that, CO2 went up exponentially. So it's like, it's, it's proven that the consensus of what people think and believe is a liberal lie that has no relation to greenhouse gas. So all these activists and this, you know, we've lost three decades because of these scientists, cunts, didn't do their fucking homework and overstepped their mandate. We, we had an option. If there hadn't have been such stupid shits, we had an option back in 1970. We could have done stuff. We had in, for the last 20 years. We can't do anything because they stole the time we had by trying to be politicians and massaging the message and trying to do PR and stuff. Completely beyond their mandate. And and so you know now we find ourselves in a position where we, they're still harping on about you know consensus and and you know mustn't lose hope and and stuff like that. But there definitely will never be any any hope of any kind of mitigation or eco restoration or anything that they try and achieve. The reason is, no one's standing on dead ground. If if they hadn't have been such stupid liberal left wing fuckheads and just talk to somebody, say in the military, the military would say, 
No, you've got to put the public on dead ground. Don't give them any fucking options. And then, you know, liberals have said, oh, but that's so, un, you know, that's not nice. And say, well, do you want extinction or nice? You can only pick one. And so then basically we would have been in a much better position. But because they're crap psychologists and they listen, you know, they listen to psychologists and economists and they're fucking Boy Scouts and don't understand the real world and have no access to the you know, reality and the military and the real world. Then we got sold up the garden path by all these believe the scientists and education. <laughs> it's like that cost us our fucking planet, you fucking morons. And so, so yeah, the if if you had have got say some some guy that was really in, in charge, he would have said like, no, I'll put these fucks on dead ground. If if anybody said, hey, can we use solar panels? Say no, you fucking idiot. It'll work, bang. What about wind farms? No, that's fucking ludicrous. Bang. So they're like, but but we've got no hope. And say, no, you're fucked. And say, so then, then people would have been listening. But nobody listened. Why? Because <laughs> they sold them hope. What did you expect? They're such bad strategists. They, they, every fucking scientist should have got rid of Foku and put fucking Sun Chu on the fucking shelf. Then we would be in a better place. Still, all this crap goes on. We've seen Extinction Rebellion and all this stuff. So late in the day, they're going to come to the conclusion as maybe, maybe we should use kryptonite and say, yeah, genius. What's the point now? Now there's absolutely no hope and it's underlined. So it's like. But maybe just to revert slightly back to the things that happened before um, the Blue Asian event potentially, like, say, the hyperinflation, the, fin the next financial crisis, maybe that is the thing that wakes people up from their comfortable, you know, uh, hope, because then they won't be so comfortable. Because the thing is, as we were saying before, they have just been doing, they've been shocking everyone continually, and it doesn't work, because everybody's so um, distracted in their comfortable lives. When that happens when the hype when they inflate this thing into the stratosphere which they've already done but you know we're just starting to feel the consequences they're going to keep going with this they're not going to default they've either got two options don't they? they default or they hyperinflate it i mean if they defaulted then i mean that would just be i can't see that happening everyone really would be running around with their hair on fire but at least if they hyperinflate they get out of it don't they they say well we can just you know, we were doing the right thing, that was the only thing we could do, and they get rid of the debt, but then finally the people wake up and say, oh, fuck, my life, I can't do it, you know, I've got a wheelbarrow full of money to pay for anything, you know, uh, obviously it won't be currency, it'll be uh, digital, but what I'm saying is, they'll, at that point, the public would be like, fuck, well, I really, because I mean, People were pretty angry at the banks after the last time, and I think another fuck up. They're going to be like, "Hang on a minute!" Finally, they might actually wake up. I don't know. Maybe they won't. Maybe they'll just do as they're told and go to some camp. <laughs> but maybe that's the point when they wake up, and they because they'd be on dead ground by then. Maybe I don't know. I yeah. The, this is why I'm I have my hair on fire because they're going to wake up. It's for certain they're going to wake up. They're like, you know, everybody on the Titanic at some point gets to realize that this ship's going down. The problem is that it comes too late. It's already too late. So the worst scenario of all is that they have a late awakening because we're in the situation in North Korea or Zimbabwe. So they, they will hyperinflate to the, basically, if you look at the U.S. dollar today, you're holding a Zimbabwean dollar. Uh, but here's the thing. Zimbabwe and North Korea survive because of, you know, China and Zimbabwe because of the surrounding African states. So there's there's nobody, there's no other planet to actually help us survive uh, when we go into that situation. So you have to imagine you've got Mugabe or you've got Kim Jong-un and he's, uh, they totalitarians and, you know, everybody's starving. It's like, well, now it's better that you don't have an awakening in a way because basically this is a this is the, the you know you it's kind of like 
it only gets worse after you know a delayed awakening is worse than even no awakening it's you know at some stage it's better that you just you know just let them shuffle forward to the gas chamber you see if you see if it, it makes it worse if you think of it, the analogy of say Auschwitz is like either you start early and have an awakening before you get to the Auschwitz or when, you know, before they really start putting people through the meat grinder. But already when, when they, you know, already putting people in the gas chambers, it's like that's the wrong time to have an awakening. Then, then you start running around like a headless chicken. They just start shooting more and they just basically they, they will get worse to get you in the gas chambers. So, so it kind of, you know, it, it, it's only good to have an epiphany while you've got options. Our options are gone. Sorry, yeah, sorry to interrupt. No, I, I guess I'm not, yeah, I get, I get all of that. I think we all get all of that. What I'm saying is, I mean, well, maybe they can hyperinflate this motherfucker, um, you know, all the way up to the Blue Ocean event. I'm suggesting maybe that financial crisis happens before, in which case, maybe at that point, more people wake up and go, hang on, I'm in dead ground here and fuck the state and... I'm not saying it's necessary. I'm not saying anything like it's savable. That would be a solution. But at least then people are, you know, going kryptonite against the system, you know, because it's happened before. I mean, because arguably this could happen much quicker. I mean, I, I, you know, I've read When Money Dies about the whole Weimar situation. That went on for quite a while. But now everything is so fast and it's all digital currency. This could happen really, really fast. And if that happens and then people are just left with no wherewithal, I don't know, but it depends how it plays out because, of course, they could just go straight away and say, oh, here you go, come to daddy, here's the cryptocurrency to solve all of that. But hopefully, by that point, people will have woken up and gone, hang on a minute, this is all fucking bollocks. Like, this isn't worth anything, you know, because they might just try it like they did you know, in previous hyperinflations, various points in history where they tried to say, hang on, no, here, here you go, look, here's a new shiny object, um, use this instead. But it didn't work, you know, like we were saying before in um, the, the Assignon and those types. I don't know, I'm just thinking before the, yeah, the final showdown, so to speak, you know. Um, yeah, it could be that this financial crisis happens quicker than we think. Or maybe they're really clever and they hide it from everyone somehow. <laughs> no, no, you, you, you nailed it. You, you, you answered your, your own uh, question there because they want uh, a financial collapse, right? So they, they want a financial restructuring more than anybody. So, so it's exactly as like if you go and look at the French with the Signat. They just they just scrap the old currency and make a new currency. So they're going to, you know, the reason why... They, into crypto and stuff is so that when uh, they get hyperinflation of the dollar and the euro and all these these crap currencies, uh, they they're going to put you on this new currency. Now the the people are not going to see it for what it is because it's uh, it'll be like food stamps. No nobody thinks of food stamps as currency or you know they don't think about inflation of food stamps. So they'd say like okay your dollars are worthless. But, you know, here's assistance. And then you're in Allison's world. So they, they, um, they, they going into this with their eyes open, right? They, they're in control. The guys in the BIS and, you know, this Klaus Schwab's financial great reset is it's being very carefully orchestrated. But, you know, they, you know what's happening because they've done experiments and they always experiment. So they've done the demonetization experiment in India. You can see what happened. Um, they've done it in Cyprus. They've done they've done bail-ins in Cyprus. All of them worked very well. I mean, from the totalitarian perspective, from the people's perspective, they were a disaster. But yeah, um, they demonetized India. They learned all the lessons, and I pres presume they've changed, altered their plans so that they they're ready. For the big rollout, but yeah, it's um, it's all laid out in front of us. Is that they will remove, uh, you know, they they want they'll take over any money you have in the bank with bail-ins, and then um, then they will give you some uh, alternative currency that is um, 
you know, something like blockchain that is um, a crypto and digital currency that that uh, allows them to do tracking and particularly um, you know, weaponize the philanthropy and all Alice and stuff. So they everything will come with um, with strings attached. So you you'll get your um, uh, social assistance and you'll you'll get your medical and stuff based on these conditions and that's how they keep control so that they they need this current system to collapse just because they need cash to collapse so that that's one of the reasons why i created geodo and another currency is you you want some competing currency for example in in greece the the drug dealers and the black market and stuff they use drachma their currency is drachma they deal with each other in drachma so it's the, the old currency because they, they need the um, untraceable currency in the, in the black market that they can use with um, exchange with each other. And so it's very important that they take currency out of our hands. And so, yeah, the, that's where they're getting to. The, the, their problem is uh, the huge accounting nightmare. You see, as soon as the uh, Goldman Sachs and all these, you know, the kind of, that collapse, in, on Wall Street, is the there are a lot of um, there are a lot of lawsuits and a huge accounting problem. Um, but you know, in terms of just uh, demonetizing public, yeah, that's that's on the cards. That's coming. So you know, you must prepare. Uh, we as the prepare for ex exactly how we cope with it. But the the main thing is to is to get out of the currency system. Is, is to find alternatives, uh, get back to real money and, um, you know, gold and silver. But even it, gold and silver is not a not a slam dunk because they'll try and uh, seize it, right? They're going to try and uh, confiscate it and stuff like that. So well, none of this is an easy run. What's your opinion on uh, things like Monero uh, and privacy coins? <laughs> I know it's cryptocurrency. I know you don't like Bitcoin. I'm just interested to know. Cause, I mean, surely that's more feasible than gold and silver. I mean, obviously, if you're talking like a real sort of at the real bitter end, like when, yeah, things are really falling apart, then gold and silver could, yeah, logically have its place. But in the interim, that's a kind of, you know, that's a pretty good candidate for being, you know, very anti-government privacy coin. Not without its faults as well, though. Yeah, but any digital currency, all of them are some flavor of a Ponzi scheme. So the original Bitcoin and Satoshi and that, it's an... And so the, the whole thing was based for tracking criminals and seeing who sold shit to who. So, and it turned out that most of it was used to for corrupt Chinese officials to get their money offshore. But, you know, they... Yeah, they've shut it down in China, and and so, so crypto is is only kept alive as long as the Ponzi scheme is going, but but it you know it's it's a it's a pure Ponzi scheme, so you'll be wiped out just like anybody that went for Ponzi stamps. Um, it... Yeah, sure, but I mean, I mean, I'm just talking about like just getting by, like you know, like if you had some chips in the system, you know, just for like day to day, you see what I'm saying? Um, or you're just saying, cause I mean, that would be at the point when they take down the internet or something. I mean, I don't know, like, you know, there are like options, aren't there, using satellites and things like that. Um, I don't know, like how feasible that is, but people have talked, I know there's been discussion before about, you know, there is ways to like independently connect to a satellite to use it you know, for for Bitcoin, for example, I'm not an advocate, and I I massively agree, I agree with most of what you, you know in that respect. What you're what you're saying about the the philosophy of it and what it was used for, but just as a sort of yeah, as an alternative <clears throat> to the, for example, the tokens that the government are going to issue you, which you really don't want to be using because they're going to be like. No, you're going to have to spend that on what we tell you to spend it on. You know, you're only allowed to spend this much this week on Coca-Cola or alcohol or whatever. 
Yeah, the, the cryptocurrencies are only around under sufferance from the government. So as soon as the, they're inconvenient for the governments, they're gone. They'll shut them. You see, this is why it's uh, all these uh, blockheads and stuff that are, that I talk to and hate me so much for saying that the the cult is is going nowhere is is the they say they think it's a technical problem and they think that you know oh we have satellites and all this stuff and it's like dude they're gonna shut it down by terror all they say is you know we cut your fucking fingers off if you catch you with bitcoin and that's the end of bitcoin so it's like all cryptos are are you know just just the based on what you know the government the government, you can't get out of the government's clutches by getting a very clever, geeky solution. And that's what all these geeks think, that they will get ultimate, ultimate power by, um, by being clever. And you say, no, the government doesn't care how clever you are. They understand you better than you. And you say, well, cut your balls off if you use Bitcoin. And that's the end of Bitcoin. So it's like it's nothing to do with how clever you are on the blockchain. And, oh, let me explain it to you. You don't understand. And it's like, no, you don't understand. That's not how the world works. It's not about it's about being terrorized, and they'll terrorize you out of using it. But now, so then, what? What's the approach to it? Well, a diversity of opinion is good. So, it, as the extinctionality, we want people to be as diverse in their opinion and do and try all of these things. But the way I see it is, you have to be nimble. You have to survive the collapse of the currency you have to make sure that you have crypto and gold and silver and stuff and other people have different strategies and then we work together when it all hits the fan you then you know you say oh tom's the crypto guy and crypto's gone through the moon and then it's important that tom doesn't say yeah well i'm a crypto billionaire now so fuck the extinction party <laughs> you must go you know oh this is the thing that that panned out now you share it amongst everybody else then when crypto goes to the wall, then, you know, uh, Sophie's got tons and tons of gold and silver hit stored away with leprechauns in Ireland. I thought it next to the rainbow. The <laughs> pile of gold. <laughs> That's where they are. Well, anyway, you, you know how to find a leprechaun and, like, hold him hostage till he tells I, you where his pot of gold is. Lo loads of so, old bridges around here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so we so then we go to Sophie, and th that's how my vision of this mutual network works, all the way down to, you know, eventually the grid goes down, and then you, you know that that somewhere is you know basically we people have boats, people have this, people have that, and we all know because we advertise it. And in, in fact, if you take this seriously enough, if we get enough funding and get this off the ground, which I can never do, but if we ever got to that stage then you'd advertise it. Advertise it on the fucking internet like all the preppers think you're crazy to do. You say, no, <laughs> you want a site where it says, you know, I live in New Zealand. I have, you know, I, I'm growing you know, puppies in the backyard and I can supply this, this, and this. You say, well, but that's crazy. You, you'll, you'll get people flooding to you and say like, yeah, in which case you'd give it all up. 200 people arrive on your doorstep, you'd give it all up. <laughs> it's like, this is, yeah, that's the way to survive. So you've got mobility, you've got lots of options, and basically lots of people with lots of different skills. And you say like, okay, everybody else is a fuckhead, and they're not going to survive. We, you know, we, we need to discuss exactly what places you want to be, how to survive. If it's like, Say, oh, shit, Hugh made a fucking big mistake. He didn't consider that if you're on a boat, this happens. And you say, okay, well, even though the internet's down and the world is fucked, you, you will, even if you're trekking overland like you're the star of the Ice Age cartoon or something, you, you will know that, like, oh, such and such is here. You know this, you know that and stuff. And then, go, you know, okay, boats are out. Try overland trek to some other person's idea you're gonna but make they, a map like in pirates of the caribbean and we'll have all I the different it. the different places and all the hidden codes and sigils for <laughs> for people to find I, each I other mean it. that's what that's that's what i'm about that's what i'm doing it's basically you you need a sigil to say you're a member of the extinction Party. It's a secret sign like the fish in the, for the Christians and stuff like that. So, so 
the 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 yeah um i mean it is like you see what works with survival if you go and look at all these scenarios this is like you, you don't have to be a jack of all hands you just need one damn skill that makes you useful to the tribe so you know all these guys all these preppers all think you have to be like bear grills and that stuff no you just have to know bear grills you only need one guy that knows what bear grills and he can look after 200 people so you know you don't have to like sailing or whatever you you just have to know where one pirate is <laughs> and then you communicate it on this you know on the you will know if we spend enough time discussing all of this stuff and you know share the same egregore you will know that ah i i know that you know this event happens well i know where you will be and then you can go there and chances are you'll find me there because we all discussed it and thought the same way but that's how you you survive but you know yeah there's a lot of value in uh like serendipity and you give to the universe and like he'll give back and yeah the community um i yeah it's a bit like um well not to take it down buddhism but you know if you sort of yeah if you give then quite often you get back don't you, you know uh, well, that doesn't mean yeah you, yeah, you want to be individualistic you want to be yeah like sharing everyone's skills but it's so true if you just take a chance and yeah discover yeah. and things go your way the universe gets back yeah it's all about trust it's all about trust and in order to trust you have to let go yeah but it's a, so that's what sigils were for so the the early christians the reason why they could just draw a little fish in the sand is that uh, and if anybody doesn't know the secret code then you know they would just think you were just drawing a fish in the sand um, but if you're a Christian, then you knew that the guy's signaling to you that he's a fer fellow Christian. So that's the same with uh, Freemasons and the secret handshake and stuff. And the point of the secret handshake is that then you instantly know you can trust this person and, and you know what the deal is. So you know as soon as somebody is in the extensionality, you know that they work by the desiderata extensionality. You know the way they think you can communicate over the tops of everybody's heads, even in the same room. So as, as soon as you made some signal, as a, the, you know, you could signal. So say, okay, here, imagine this movie scenario. You, you're under, this is, happens with Freemasons, right? The Freemasons were in the police for, the, the UK police are riddled with Freemasons. There's a good reason for it. Because when, imagine you're under interrogation by some, some you know, in some hellhole in some police thing or something. You make a, you think this guy might be an extinction artist. You make a secret symbol that only he realizes what you're signaling, and you establish, yeah, he's a secret extinction artist. Well, you as the as the prisoner interrogated, and and he as the guy on the inside, you can own the whole precinct working together. You know, if if nobody else knows, that's what you're doing. So that, that's that's the whole power of it. That's why, you know, in in so many ways, it's like. As soon as you establish that somebody knows the secret handshake, then you know, oh, you can use the secret currency. You can tell them about this and that and stuff like that. And that's, that's how all of this stuff works. That's how you survive totalitarianism. It's, it's by having a, a really a society that's underground that escapes the immune system of the bigger system. So that's, that's the whole point, right? You have to get to an egregore where everybody thinks the same. It doesn't doesn't really work if uh, if these people, you know, the, it's a if it's a big tent and the, you know these people think, oh, there's still time for solar panels and wind farms. It's like, well, they're not really on the same page. <laughs> you know, they still got a little work to do. So yeah, it's, but that's why I say that like faulty and that making a big mistake because they're embarking on this idiocy with this naive idea that everybody can reach a consensus without putting in the work to actually reach an egregore and actually agree. So they want to short circuit the whole thing on the, uh, on this fool's idea that we're all the same underneath and this liberal thing is like, no, we fucking aren't. We're not even close to being the same. Look at all the people in, you know, 
the guys in uh, Extinction Rebellion, the, these guys would uh, sell you out for, for animal rebellion. You know, and then these guys are Christians. Well, they're going to fucking do you in for some fucking Christian thing about abortion. You don't know where you stand. You, you could never conspire with any of those guys or have a sh secret handshake because, because you might tread on one of their sacred landmines. Like, you know, there'd be uh, be trans or something. And then you'd be, you'd be like, offend their trans thing without realizing it. And then they'd fucking execute you. So it's like, you know, you can't. You first have to establish this unity of uh in this single mind then you can do anything they they starting with the easy shit this you got to do the difficult shit first and establish the ego that's why you, that's why things like the the white lotus society and stuff was so so fucking dangerous for for the the ming dynasty and stuff like that because they that they, they they were a bunch of people that understood each other were all comrades and were against the system and the system couldn't ferret them out they never knew they never knew that basically this high official or those peasants might be in cahoots with each other you know but they just signal across the room so it's like terribly dangerous because the the state can't get that kind of unity they 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 just keeping people together by fear coercion by indoctrination all these tricks and then these guys come that like just of one mind. It's like the Borg. <laughs> yeah, it's it's literally like creating a community again, like a real one, not a fake one, like the state does. Yeah. So th there's a lot of weeding that goes on, and a lot of the, you know this this is what I feel is a good use for social media is you weeding out undesirables and stuff, and just slowly build, slowly build, and see see where you get to, and then. When the shit hits the fan, you, you take the stage with what you got. But anyway, this is why I want to grow the extinction on it. <laughs> um, yep. Just step by step. So I don't think this is all happening like tomorrow. We've got years. So, yeah. And anyway, I hope I'm not selling you down the garden path, but I think we have, we have warning. You can. Maybe maybe uh, that's my conceit, but I I think you'll be able to read this. You'll be able to read the flipping. You'll be able to see how far it's gone, and so you know, especially if you widen the network and share all this information. Um, so yeah, there's there's what we were about. So that's it's good. You know. Well, should we round it up then? Wind it up. All right. Anybody got any closing thoughts or anything that they want? Um, no, actually, yeah, nothing comes to mind. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so let's just do the discipline of just being mindful and just for still. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Very thanks. Much. Stay well be, during the week. Be safe oh, out there. Oh, yeah. Avoid the G. Avoid the G. <laughs> the G's <there> in. <laughs>